So I just wrote a book called Age of Context, which is about how you're going to basically be tracked as you live your life. And uh, all sorts of fun things are going to happen because of that tracking. And uh, I wanted to see some of the technology that's going to go into retail stores to do some of this tracking, uh, looking at you and looking at your uh, behaviors and see what the kind of what the future of retail is going to look like. And uh, that's why we have Brickstream here right now to see the future of retail. Who are you? I'm Christina Elwood. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Brickstream Corporation. And tell me something about your background. Oh, I'm a longtime tech person. I've uh, probably worked for a dozen startups and a couple of large uh, companies. I'm an entrepreneur as well. And I came to Brickstream about a year ago uh, to help them to move into the direct market, providing in-store analytics. They had been in the market for a number of years doing uh, door counting applications, but their technology was sophisticated enough to take it inside the store and do very sophisticated work like queue management and uh, end cap analytics and that sort of thing. And so that's what we've been doing for the last year. So retail is about to really shift and we're starting to get some, uh, some um, precursors, right? I, Apple says they're putting low energy Bluetooth into their uh, stores and into baseball stadiums. Um, the demo guide was just handed to Shelf Bucks, which is a, a, a thing that's going to be in the, in the grocery store shelves. You're going to tap in with your phone, whether you have uh, you know, low energy Bluetooth or uh, uh, NFC or something else on there. And then we're seeing all sorts of camera technologies and 3D technologies like shopper pep, shop reception that we saw at Consumer Electronics. That's using the Prime Sense sensor that it, Apple just bought, you know, from Israel. Uh, that's going to look at uh, even ha uh, how how you touch things, right? Because if if I know that you're touching things, that tells me a lot about you. Um, what do you guys do? How do you fit into this new future of retail puzzle? So. Like some of the technologies that you just mentioned, we're really responding to the need of retailers and others that manage physical spaces like entertainment venues to understand what is going on in their space with their visitors. It's just like doing clickstream analytics on a website. Clickstream analytics can be used to measure everything going on on the site. How many people have come to the site? Where have they gone? How long have they stayed? Yeah. But brick and mortar environments don't have the equivalent of a click stream that they get for free that is perfectly accurate. Um, so they have to capture the data. And so there are a number of technologies that have come on the market to do that. Brickstream um, uses stereo vision analytics. And in fact, this is our, our core product today. Yeah. Okay, this uh, device is a Brickstream two, a 3D device, and it has two lenses that like your eyes, are able to perceive depth. Now in the case of our device, which is mounted in the ceiling over the head of a visitor, that depth is really the height. So it measures the height, the direction, the speed, and the mass of the objects that come into the field of view of the camera. Some of those are people, some of those are strollers, some of those are children, and it is able to discern the difference between all of those. In fact, it can even tell what's called a shopping unit. So if a couple comes in together or a family comes in together, it will track them as a single shopping unit and not as separate individuals. So to understand what's going on in your, in your physical environment, you have to collect the data. And it has to be accurate or all of the assumptions that you make for the analytics that you get afterwards are going to be wrong. Now this is usually a, you know, a field of view, so you can watch one grocery uh, line or two, maybe two, or you can follow the cookie aisle, you know, or, right. or like Budweiser could pay for this to be put in, in uh, around the beer end cap or something just to watch what, what's going on there. Can, they can I put an array of these in a grocery store and watch somebody, you know, 
go around the store? Because there's can. no personal information here, right? Uh, you can't tell Robert Scoble walked into the grocery store, right? I suppose if you had a very distinctive tattoo on the center of your head, you could. <laughs> well, that, then Rocky's nailed. <laughs> <laughs> For that we actually have a privacy filter that can be enabled and cannot be disabled once enabled so that you you don't even have that information so yes it is anonymous um, data and yes you can put enough devices in the ceiling of the store some of our customers do that to track people all the way through the store everywhere they go everywhere they stop or dwell or, so or what, spend extra time do they do the, does it work like a military satellite does it just uh, say oh that's object number 15 15 59 and it tracks that object as it goes through the store? Exactly right. So it assigns a tag, and a, a you know, unique tag to that particular um, object or person, and then it can link from one device to another so that it can follow the path contiguously all the way through the space. Now, if you can do that, well, I use my Safeway card when I pay. So couldn't it figure out that object 1559 at the end of the... When I pull out my credit card, my Safeway card, all of a sudden, oh, that's Robert Scoville. <laughs> and we it get could. to stock Robert Scoville through the store and know that he visited the cookie aisle and then the wine aisle and <laughs> yes, all that Yes, it fun could. Stuff, In right? theory, yes, you could do that. We do um, have a cloud-based analytics back end that integrates with the POS system. Yeah. And so you could, in fact, correlate that and say this is uh, Robert just you know, went to the beer aisle and then the cookie aisle and he likes to drink beer with his cookies. You probably could do that. Most right. retailers, though, are not particularly interested in that level of granularity for their basic Sorry. behavioral analytics. Somebody's calling my glass. And that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. So what they're really interested in the aggregate information. Yeah. You know, the number of people that flow a particular way through and how many people stop in a particular location or what have you. So they're looking for improving the performance of the store. They're looking to optimize their use of labor. They're interested in providing a definitive customer experience. It, one of the things that's true about how you experience customer service in a store is you want it to be consistent. You don't want to have a good experience one day and a bad experience the next. Right. So they actually try to control it within like, a fairly narrow range. It's like Starbucks. The coffee's okay, but it's never extraordinary. But it's always the same cup of coffee worldwide. Right? Exactly right. And so I only drink it when I travel. Yeah. Right? Because I want the best coffee I can get, and it, that is reliable. And that's really what most people are looking for in their service experience. But the retailer defines the service experience they want to deliver, and then they need data to support whether or not it's being delivered. Yeah. So in the case of a queue, for example, people are very sensitive to how long they wait. And we're heading into the, sh the holiday shopping season, and those lines are you know, something everybody anticipates as being a negative. So a retailer that can use a KPI, a key performance indicator about wait time, and have in real time the actual wait time of people in the line being reported to the store manager. That gives the store manager a chance to redeploy labor from another part of the store to the front of the store to get those wait times down. Here's, uh, in my book, I, I started uh, realizing there's two lessons for business. One is if you study everything about everything, you'll be able to build a new kind of product. Uh, and you, you told me about wait times. I'd love to sit at home and go, hey, the wait time at Safeway is less than 10 minutes right now. It's a good time to go. But if the lines are like half an hour, uh, I don't think I'll go to it right now. You know? So you'd like Safeway to publish their actual uh, wait times to an app. Absolutely. They could definitely do that. In fact, the, the uh, fact that the uh, world of retail is moving into multi-channel where they recognize that you're sitting on your phone at home trying to decide whether this is the right time to go to the store, all retailers are having to respond to that reality. You walk in more knowledgeable than the people who work in the store because you've already researched things before you got there. You've done web rooming, right? Yeah. You um, are able to make a choice based on uh, information that's on social media. Oh, this damn line's so long at such and such a retailer. Well, maybe you aren't going to go right then because you know there's been some complaints on Twitter that it's slow or what have yeah. you. So getting this data inside of a physical space like a store or an airport or even a hospital is very important to people who manage those spaces because the, the success or failure of their, uh, their service delivery is tied to how much they know about what's going on. It's so, tr even true of museums. When I visited the museum in uh, Washington, D.C., the, the guy who runs it uh, knew the dwell time of uh, each room. He knew, you know... Um, he knew the popularity of each exhibit, basically, right? Yeah, basically. Which is, 
uh, and so he knew where to put put more resources and where to mar how to market his museum because he knew what people found interesting there. Absolutely. In fact, in the early days of uh, Brickstream doing uh, work with our with our three D device, the one I just showed you, um, they worked with a pharmacy who thought they knew that their very first end cap as you came in the door was the most valuable end cap in the store, and it was set at an angle, and they were they just knew it, right? I mean, just. It was intuitive that would be the most valuable in Kaplan's store. But when they actually measured it, it was actually the lowest dwell time of all end caps in the store. Hmm. But they didn't know that. And there was no way for them to know that. When yeah. you're running thousands of stores as a retailer yeah. and you don't have a way to passively and anonymously collect data about what's going in the store, you're running blind a lot of the time. Yep. So it's really important to get that data. Yep. And in fact, the other uh, side of criticality, if you will, in running a physical space is security. And almost every retail space and almost every physical environment that you go into these days, there are security cameras that are there for that reason. And what we've done most recently, and the reason that we're here today to talk with you, is yeah. that we are introducing a new device, which we call Brickstream Live, that combines that stereo vision analytics technology from our 3D device yeah. with a high uh, resolution video surveillance camera that has an ultra wide lens on it and lots of great specs, typical type of high resolution video surveillance camera. And it will take that video feed and it will send it to any conventional VMS system that's on VIF compliant. Yeah. So the retailer doesn't have to change out anything in their loss prevention environment to be able to capture that data but now they don't have to have two devices in the ceiling. They don't have to buy, install, configure, and manage two devices. On top of it, then, we can take advantage of both pieces of information to provide new analytics that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And to make this even more valuable, we added to the, to the uh, device, in addition to the network interface and a control interface, we added a USB port. Yeah. And that USB port can be used to connect a BLE Bluetooth low energy receiver or a Wi-Fi receiver or an RFID receiver to collect wireless data. Yeah. And that allows the retailer now to get proximity analytics in the same device. So now you've got behavior analytics, you've got video analytics, and you've got proximity analytics all in one manageable device. Now would you, would you still put this over your head, head aim straight down because, uh, you know, if somebody's ripping me off, I want their face. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So this lens, unlike these two, which are fixed, in yeah. fact, part of the challenge of doing 3D stereotype analytics is that you have to have a known position for those lenses. So those are very carefully positioned and fixed in place. This uh, lens, the, the surveillance lens, is a pan, tilt, zoom lens. Okay. So you can angle it so that you can, in fact, see what you need to be able to see. Interesting. Right? So it's like one of those things at the, uh, at the um, casinos, you know, where they get to zoom in and move the lens. It's always in a dome. But um, this is a prototype, or is this a... No, this is an okay. actual unit. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Lenses. You can take the lens yeah. cap off oh, if you'd there's like. lens oh, caps. sure. Okay. Yeah, there's <laughs> lens caps on there because, in fact, this, this I literally took it out of the plastic before yeah. I left this morning. So. Ah, there we go. So yeah. it has a microdome on it. That's why I was... Uh, yeah, it does, exactly. Uh, and it's a 5 meg... I'm not going to take that one off because yeah. it's giving me a little bit of trouble. All right. Um, but it's a 5 megapixel lens. It's H.264. It'll stream two independent feeds at two different resolutions. So you could have one stream at the wide angle and you could have one stream at the narrow angle, right? Or at the unwarped, if you will. Yep. It does support dewarping. Um, I mentioned that it's OnVIF compliant. Yep. Um, the whole device is a very low power device. It uses less power than an eight watt LED bulb. Okay? But it's got the computing power of that device you have on your head. Yeah. So it's got the same type of processing that Google Glass has, if Google Glass had more enhanced video than, than yeah. uh, what it has. So it's a it's very coming. powerful device. It'll store about 30 days of uh, video, of the surveillance video, so it's like a 30-day DVR. Interesting. Uh, so it stores video in here, so if somebody rips you off, you can get to the uh, video that's actually stored 
it doesn't need to talk to the cloud. It doesn't need to talk to the cloud, it, and it doesn't it need to go back to the VMS, but yeah. that's where most people are going to go, because video yeah. management systems make it very easy to search video. Yeah. But everything is time-stamped, and so is the behavior data, so you're able to quickly go in and find the video that you want, which my, is, which is you know, clearly... My brother owns a bar, and he put a bunch of video cameras in, and so he can watch his employees from his uh, phone. Right, which is there you go. Useful. I bet you helped him with that. I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's pretty cool to be able to watch everybody and know who's in the store and how busy people are, and so it helps a little bit with uh, figuring out, you know, uh, why didn't things get done or you know all that stuff. You can uh, with this, you can watch uh, uh, people ripping off the store even with their working with their friends, right? You, you had a word. Yeah, for this. there's a there's a big loss prevention problem for retailers called sweethearting where one person, the cashier, is in cahoots with a, a sh quote, shopper that's come into the store. The shopper will bring, say, a dozen items to the front of the store, and the checker will only uh, scan a small number of them, say, eight of them. So uh, the shopper walks out with 12 items, and they've only paid for eight items. So that's a very uh, big problem uh, that retailers struggle with, and the behavior analytics can help with that, but the, the biggest source of detection for sweethearting is looking at the POS data, the point of sale data, because there's a different pattern of behavior and so forth in the, in the data there. And so they pretty much know when sweethearting is happening, but they don't actually have any cooperating evidence. So this yeah. gives them the cooperating evidence that they need. Yeah. So you'll have a video stream with actual purchase data, like this person purchased XYZ items, and yeah. right on top of the video of that person checking out. Plus the, plus the behavior analytics too. Yeah. So if, there's, if there happens to be a difference in uh, behavior activity as a function of sweethearting, that'll be detected as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, and similarly, uh, dual functionality, um, if you put this device at an end cap, you can use behavior analytics to see who's, how often people stop at that display and how long they spend at the display. But you can use the video to determine if the display is compliant. So what happens is merchandising designs a beautiful display and they send the display materials to the store with a picture of how it's supposed to look. And it's the retail operations group that is responsible to put that display together in the store. Well, how does merchandising know if that was done or whether it was done correctly or whether the product is neatly on that end cap or whether the sign is hanging straight or what have you? They have no way to know. So this gives them a way to know. They can use that video to take snapshots of that end cap at periodic times and then look at the data in conjunction with the behavior data. So, yes. oh, I, it was stopping at a certain rate, and now it's gone down. What's happened? They can, just like your brother, they can look at that video and say, oh, I see what's happened. Somebody moved this other display close to the end cap, and it's causing people to walk further around, and so fewer people are stopping. In fact, we, we found that in one of the end cap analysis uh, projects that we did. Um, we were looking at two stores. Um, they had similar layout, and this particular end cap had the same display, but one was performing very differently than the other. And we looked at the video and lo and behold, someone had put an, a, a, one of those cardboard freestanding displays um, at the, near that end cap and people were taking a wide turn and they weren't seeing what was on the, the shelf at all. So they completely missed the end cap display. Can this technology be used for predictive inventory? You know, if I, if I get to watch a, a Budweiser display over time and I can see how many people are taking beer off of it, I could probably predict when I'm going to need another order to make sure that store is stocked up. Sure. So an example that we, um, we do today is we predict what the wait times will be at the queue based on the traffic at the door. So it's a very similar example. And if you were using BLE or you were using some type of um, NCAP uh, data capture, could be this data capture, you could start doing correlations with that as well. Now, it also depends on what type of traffic it is. So that would be a good example where maybe gender might be a good additional piece of analytics to have to go along with that, um, that analysis. Another interesting example is um, if you're, a lot of retailers are using Facebook. Um, some shoppers are really love their coupons and their bargains and so forth and that's a, they've yeah. found facebook to be a very good way to take those um, types of uh, customers and feed them uh, uh, offers that they find very compelling um, so if the facebook team has their traffic dashboard for the stores sitting next to them as they're putting their their program together and they notify the store manager on their brickstream dashboard 
that they're going to launch a, a, a campaign with a special offer, the manager can make sure he has the product on the shelf and it's nicely stocked. The campaign can run. The Facebook team can see the increase in the traffic or the not increase in traffic, in which case it's not a very good offer, yeah. right? And then you can correlate the product conversion. You can say how many people who we drove into the store with that offer actually paid for, you know, bought and paid for those products. And so now you have a closed loop system between your offers on your social media and your actual sales in the store. Are you, you know, at a, a more expensive store, like a camera store or a coach store, something like that, uh, they know that if you touch a product, uh, the rates of buying that product go way up. I think it's, I don't know, it's way up. Um, so I would want a camera overhead of a camera display to understand how long did somebody touch something? Did they touch it? And did they end up buying? Did they end up walking out? And then um, I'd love to figure out, did they buy it off of Amazon? You know, are they using it, showrooming it, right? right. Coming in to see the, the product and then buying it on Amazon because it's cheaper. And can I change that rate of leaving? My, right. my boss, at, when I ran a retail store, said, everybody comes in the front door to buy, so don't let them leave. <laughs> <laughs> right? no, that, that's actually an interesting um, uh, belief on your, on your old boss's part, because a lot of retailers believe that, that are in what they consider to be destination stores. We were talking about grocers earlier. Yeah. A lot of grocers believe that people come to the grocery store to buy, and so they don't need to look at sales conversion because they know it's basically 100%. But in fact, if you measure it, it's not 100%. They have abandonment in grocery stores, and they have people that come in to shop and not buy. They just didn't know that. It wasn't that it wasn't happening, right? Um, there was a tried and true tradition in this country of window shopping, and so all retailers have yeah. a less than 100% conversion rate. The question is, what should it be? What is it? What should it be? And is there anything I can do to impact it? And you can't answer those questions if you don't have the data. Yep. So... There's, by the way, uh, even if somebody leaves, um, a lot in the '80s they would bring in spreadsheets and they would, you know, have Nikon F3 lens, lens, flash, bag, tripod, that kind of thing, and I would fill in the spreadsheet for all my competitors and myself, and that got a lot of people to come back because they would go to my competitor, you know, San Jose camera, or whatever and realize I knew their prices better than they did. Wow. <laughs> and, and that made me an expert on the marketplace. And when you find an expert on the marketplace, the trust, the trust of that person goes up. So you want to do business with that person, even if the price is the same. Well, right? you know, the truth of the matter is- And my is, price was always lower, by the, the way. Well, but. of course, because you made sure it was always lower, <laughs> yeah, of right? Because you knew what everybody else's price was, right? Yeah, so the fundamental currency of all business is trust. Yeah. And that, that deals with issues like, um, uh, who you want to buy from, but it also deals with issues like privacy. Yeah. You're more willing to give information about yourself to someone you trust than someone you do not trust. And there was some a recent research done, um, I can't think of her name right off the top of my head, but she just did this research um, a few months ago where she was looking at how much people were using mobile phones in stores. And the, the first surprising response, given that we keep hearing these large numbers, 80% of people use their phones in stores. But when they do direct observation, what they find is people hardly ever use their cell phone in the store. And if you go back and look at the data, they were asked if you ever use your cell phone in the store. Well, maybe once a year you do, but you don't do it on every trip. Yeah. And the reason you don't use it on every trip is because your hands are full. Your hands are busy. You're looking at things. You were talking about touching. If you're touching things, your hands are busy. So you don't, you're not looking at your cell phone when you're doing yeah. that. Now, if you are looking up a price, of course, then you are. In a mall, people use their phones in the hallway, according yeah. to her data, more than they use them in the store. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And so you might want to know that they are in the hallway outside your store and send them information at that point in time instead of sending it to them when they're in the store and their hands are busy. Yeah, I, I think that's actually why uh, Google did this thing. Because um, they are always looking at figuring out intent before anybody else does. And if I'm walking down a mall and just walking straight through, that's one kind of intent. But if I stare at the Gap and then stare at the Apple Store, that's a different kind of intent. And this has sensors to know that I'm looking at different things, right? Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Now, when yeah. that comes to play in the retail environment, um, you know, if we if we think about it, this exemplifies this device exemplifies the five forces you talk about in Asia context, yeah. right? It social. Has, it has social, mobile. Sensor, location, and big data, yep. right? 
all five in one single uh, device on the retailer side of capturing data. So it's like a vacuum cleaner for sucking up five forces data. Well, the same is true of your Google Glass, except it's being done on behalf of the consumer. Yeah. So what happens when the data, the contextual data for the consumer meets the contextual data for the retailer? What can the retailer do to deliver you a rich experience in the store because they have the contextual information? They can say, 90% of people like you go down this aisle. <laughs> they can. They can. And 79% of people like you bought, you know, Sutter Home Wine or whatever. You know? <laughs> exactly. They, can, they absolutely can so. do things like that. Or they could have a, a service person waiting in the aisle with the cookies after you've been to the beer. Yeah. Right? Because they know that's where you're going to go and they know that, that you might need help there. Right, for yeah. whatever reason, people need more help in one type of aisle than another type of aisle. And or, so they can be responsive to that. What, you know, that's... To, to me, uh, to, and people watching probably is like, I don't care about any of that. But they can augment my experience. They can have uh, d demos in the store and mm -hmm. push me there. All of a sudden, because I bought XYZ, I'm now, now spending some time with a human trying something new, and it's all because it got directed that way, right? Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing that happen at ski resorts. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it happen in wineries and other places, and uh, this technology is gonna augment that and, and let brands think about customer service in a whole new way. Oh, I think that's so true. And, and, and actually, one of, you mentioned stadiums. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we uh, did an application for Wembley Stadium, um, and there was an application you wrote about in your book um, yeah. about the, uh, Saints, uh, the, the Patriots, Patriots, right, yeah. that the Patriots were providing their, uh, their spectators, their loyal spectators, their season ticket holders with an app that would uh, offer them uh, a coupon on their food, for example, a few minutes before um, the masses are going to end up at the concession so they don't have to wait in line. Um, we have one that we're working with with a different stadium now where they want to have an app that will tell you how long the restroom line is yeah. and where the shortest restroom line, uh, you know, of all the restrooms in the stadium, which is the closest one to you that has a short line. Those are great examples, right? I mean, they want to deliver you the best possible experience when you're at that game. And the things that annoy you are the things like, I missed the big play because I was standing in the restroom line, Yeah. right? Yeah, the, the newer stadiums actually put TV screens in the restrooms, <laughs> so you never miss <laughs> out. <laughs> it's like, wait a second. <laughs> That's another solution to the yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think technology being brought to bear against um, making people feel uh, more comfortable, more engaged, more um, uh, sort of knowledgeable or informed about what is um, um, available to them is a really good thing. I think people love that. And I think you're gonna see stores transition to being more of a place for engagement. How much does this stuff cost to put into a bar or a store or a museum, something like that? Well, it varies quite a bit depending on, as we mentioned, you can put enough devices in to cover the entire ceiling of the store in order to track people all the way through it. Or you could put just a single device at the door to track the um, arrivals and departures. Single device and, 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 and so forth. What would that cost? Rough and ready, you'd be in the sort of thousand dollar range. Okay. Yeah. And is there a service fee to have access to the analytics over time, or is it just one time I buy the device and put it in the store? There's a software subscription fee to the analytics on the back end, but there isn't to the um, to the software that's in the device itself. So you can amortize that over a long period of time. But models are changing. I mean, for a long time, retailers didn't want their data outside of the firewall. They wanted it inside of their own firewall. Yeah. They're now starting to get more comfortable with an, uh, an ASP type model where they're not it's not a SaaS model, but it's not inside their firewall. We do quite a few of our customers on an ASP model, but even more of them are migrating to SaaS. And as that happens, the software models and the pricing models are going to change. Interesting. Right? Where do uh, people learn more about you guys? Brickstream.com is our URL. Um, it's Brickstream like Clickstream because we do the equivalent of Clickstream analytics. Um, and our URL is just our name. Very cool. Thanks so much for coming in and talking Thank about you. the future of retail. It's really interesting. Uh, I didn't have devices when I ran my retail store back in the 80s. So. But I bet you'd have one of these if oh, it was I probably available. Would. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.